Chapter 1 T'Challa loved his job as the Black Panther. His latest Chala gene concerned a peculiar mutant arms race. Underworld geneticists were tasked with the creation of an Omega mutant with the ability to never lose. Every major human superpower nation was involved in the race except for Wakanda. The reason for the interest in that specific mutancy was that an ancient mutant called Isksa the Unbeaten had returned to Earth. Her power set allowed her to win at anything that she was involved in and also forced her to unwillingly switch Ali Jenks from a losing side to a winning side. As a tactical state leader T'Challa saw the benefit of having such a mutant in a military arsenal in the role of a pawn but nothing else. He would not entrust to her tactile or sensitive information because she was a natural-born traitor. He could only surmise that Isksa was internally very lonely and eager to prove herself at every turn to her mutant homeland of Arako even though she had involuntarily betrayed them on the battlefield in a war with the other mutant nation Krako. Wakandan scientists were being solicited to enter the arms race so T'Challa was presently drafting a memo to send out to the Wakanda science fraternity. There might be a minority who would not heed this warning so he made it clear on the severity of the punishments not only for themselves but their families. Now another matter concerning Arako was in the purview of the Black Panther. Before the living island of Arako and its mutant inhabitants had vanished from the earth million eons ago there had been a war between the mutants and the Uhuri. The Uhuri had lost the war and Eve Nudali became ocean dwellers. Susan Storm of the family of explorers called the Fantastic Four had become the leader of the remnants of the Uhuri people. She asked if Wakanda could assist if Arako attacked Uhuri. T'Challa took a stroll in one of the savannas in the heartland of Wakanda to gather his thoughts on the Uhuri matter. The Fantastic Four were his per se on L friends but to involve Wakanda in hostilities that had nothing to do with it did not seem justified. His uncle Esyan had taught T'Challa political code words or dog whistles that were commonly used in foreign relations. For example climate change was code to stop targeted emerging economies from industrializing and maximizing their natural resources for their benefit so that they will not become competitors to the major powers, GDP indicated how well the ruling families in a country were doing. Bilateral Trade Commission meant that money from a larger country was funnelled into a smaller country only for that same money to be used to buy foreign debt from the larger country. And peace talks meant a business transaction was being settled and monies divided up. T'Challa had to find a code word or phrase that would allow Wakanda to assist Uhuri without offering assistance. He chose the term open-ended presence. It was perfect because it gave no assurances, no timelines, and no accountability. Chapter 2 After the Wakanda Parliament conceded to the open-ended presence in Uhuri, T'Challa embarked on a civil engineering expedition to the Oceanic Nation in the Antarctica. Civil engineering development was another foreign relations code that meant paying bribes to foreign leaders and their friends through the construction of so-called white elephant projects. But T'Challa genuinely wanted to see how the people of Uhuri lived. The war with the ancient mutants had erased the Uharians from history and sent them into hiding. The Black Panther went alone on the mission since he did not want to waste the precious manpower of his staff on a favor to his friend. The Uhuri were scaly humanoids with fierce faces and dim red eyes. The masonry work on their city seemed Atlantean at first glance but on closer inspection the designs were truly unique to the culture. The city could be flooded with water or drained out to accommodate guests like what was done for T'Challa's visit. The tour of the city was interrupted by the news of an intruder. The person was presently walking the avenues of the main urban center having dispatched the security forces with ease. It was a mystery how the person got into the city so T'Challa went to investigate the matter. He discovered that the intruder was Isksa the Unbeaten. There were various symbols on her limbs and face, a massive sword was slung over the shoulder and she appeared to be half naked but it was hard to determine because her skin and minimal apparel blended into each other. Who are you? she asked. The Black Panther, replied T'Challa. The Wakandan King. 
I understand that you were once married to Storm which was a pitiful attempt at human and mutant coexistence, said Isksa the Unbeaten. What are you doing here? asked Tichala. I came to take Ohari metal for my forge. Now step aside before you get hurt. Tichala hadn't known that she was a blacksmith. What do you mean by take? asked Tichala. Look I don't have to answer your questions, said Isksa and passed him. From what I was told Uhuri metal was looted by your kind after the Great War. The only piece of the metal left is a ceremonial crown that it is worn by the present queen. I am sure she will gladly surrender it if you promise not to return, said Tichala. Where is she? Off world, replied Tichala. That's a problem so now I have to personally check to see if there is truly no more of the metal here, said Isksa accompanied with a grin. Can you do that after a drink? Chapter 3 The Uhuri prepared a private area for Tichala and Isksa to parley. Your return to Earth has caused a lot of confusion in the world, said Tichala. It is expected since mutants are the rightful rulers of the planet. Humans will try to mount a defense and the machines will go on the offensive, said Isksa. You misinterpreted my statement. It is you in particular that has the world abuzz. You cannot lose and your power is on a planetary scale which is called Omega Level, said Tichala. Jean Grey has been feeding you quite a lot of information, said Isksa. Tichala was surprised but didn't show it. My peers on the Iraqo Council discovered that she was a spy some time ago. We were genuinely intrigued that the back door in her telepathy led to Wakanda a nation that we intend to strike first after we deal with the machine nation, said Isksa. Tichala was even more surprised that someone gave her a position on a council, he suspected it was a low level. Wakanda is no threat to you. Not as yet but our seers have foretold of events and we will take appropriate actions. Why are you telling me this? Because we will win. You cannot change that outcome. I doubt that. Do you want to hear a joke Black Panther? I was assigned to invade the unconquered Wakanda and bring its king in chains to Arako. It must be my luck to have stumbled upon you here without the resources of your nation to back you up said Isksa and she took another drink of wine. She detached her sword from her body and leaned it against the table. I call this blade mercy because it brings about a swift death to my opponents, said Isksa and thumped her glass on the table. That is not the reason for the name, said Tichala. Excuse me. You are an alcoholic by the way I noticed how you masked your reactions to the liqueurs. They ease your pain and self-hatred. It must have been tough to have betrayed your people during the war that removed Erico from the earth. To have been forced by your own body to kill mutants that you once called brothers and sisters. That's the reason the sword is called mercy. You wish for the day when it would be used on you to end your shameful existence, said Tichala. She stared at him as though she could reach into him instead she grabbed the sword handle. Chapter 4 The Cybernetics in Tichala's ceremonial suit experienced a massive critical failure like he had never experienced before as Isksa attacked him. His calf muscles and his fingers cramped up so his defensive maneuvers were awkward. He felt like he was not fighting her alone but some other presence that was aiding her. He used the thick dining table as a shield but she sliced through it. He made a horizontal twirl in the air with his right fist aimed at Isksa's jaw. He did not get the clean impact that he wanted else his superhuman strength would have decapitated her. She fell back but was able to severely injure him in the process with a sword cut. She held her face gingerly and ran out of the parley area meanwhile Tichala was immobile on the ground as his muscles would not respond to his commands and he bled from a shoulder wound. He had to find a way to get up before she returned. Next story, Exceptionalism Tichala the Black Panther Inceptionalism Chapter 1 Isksa the Unbeaten deliberately dragged her sword's blade on the ground to signal her imminent arrival to kill Tichala and he was cognizant of the tactic. Apart from the ominous sound from the instrument of death, 
Tichala smelled Isksa and heard her heartbeats with his hyper senses. He gauged that Isksa was two chambers away from him having fixed her jaw that he had broken moments ago. He was alone inside of a dining hall, he was prostrate on the floor and had a deep slash in his shoulder. Tichala meditated on regaining control of his body as he had learned in the training to become the Black Panther of Wakanda. The ransacked dining chamber that he laid in became like a tomb until Tichala sensed the seepage of air into the floor. Then he remembered that the Uhuri had drained the city. What he heard was likely a tunnel that took out the drained ocean water. He crawled to the cover of the tunnel and tore it off. He tumbled into it and fell for about a minute. His vibranium ceremonial suit absorbed the shock of the impact when he finally reached the bottom. Yellow sparks fell on him, they were made from Isksa striking the tunnel wall with her sword to slow down her momentum as she descended. A focused Tichala crawled along the pathway and extracted the claws in his gloves. There was no light so he relied on his night vision. Then he saw medium-sized metal pipes that ran on the lower parts of the walls. He cut off a section of the pipe with his claws and made a makeshift spear with it. A hot gas came out of the broken pipe and it rose to top of the pathway which provided a thick cover for Tichala. Then he noticed the hollowness of the surface that he was on, he felt around the edges and realized he could lift up the flooring of the pathway. Isksa made a loud thud when she landed so he quickly forced himself below the flooring and covered himself with it. Isksa's footsteps were soft when she walked. Based on where her steps were made Tichala determined where the weight of her body was being placed and how she held the sword. Soon she passed over him. Tichala summoned every bit of willpower to push off the flooring and stab Isksa with the spear. She yelled in agony. He caught her in a submission hold that squeezed her throat and nullified her arms. She tried in vain to bite him. But because of the blood loss from the slash Tichala could not continue for long and he did not really want to kill her. Yield, said Tichala. The sudden sound of raging ocean water coming down the pathway took his focus away from Isksa. Chapter 2 Tichala felt that the strange force that Isksa's mutant ability had on him was removed when the two warriors were struck with the water. He realized that she knew their survival rested on him. The cybernetics in his suit came back online and his muscles loosened. Tichala teleported Isksa and himself to the small Wakandan airship that was docked at Uhuri City. Tichala released Isksa and pushed her away. Enough, said Tichala. I will say when this duel is finished, said Isksa. I don't care, said Tichala. Then he treated his wound while Isksa waited. Then he offered her medicine to treat her jaw and leg which she accepted. Why did they flood the city, asked Isksa. We are not sure if it was on purpose, your mutant power might have played a part, replied Tichala. Why do you think so highly of them? The Uhuri were notorious barbarians and my people led a just war to vanquish these scum, said Isksa. But they have changed, said Tichala. An Uhuri is an Uhuri, said Isksa. What gives you the moral authority? Because I am morally superior to them. You are a turncoat, said Tichala. Don't go into my personal life again. Are you even in a relationship? Your sister married Apocalypse and had children with him. Enough. Do you think I will win this argument, asked Tichala. I want you to remember that question when I march into Wakanda, said Isksa. Tichala gave her a full kiss on the mouth. Her hard veneer became gentle as she allowed him to continue. She was breathless when he finished. You think you know me, she asked. You are lonely which is the curse of always winning, replied Tichala. How do you know? I was the same way burdened by exceptionalism. Unfortunately you are a backstabber so it is very likely the hole that you fell in your chest will never go away, replied Tichala. And not even pouring your soul into sword making will change that such is your fate. You are a cruel human, 
said Isksa. Be my spy on Arako and I will help you control your power. She laughed uncontrollably for about a minute. She rested her hand on his shoulder as the laughter subsided. As you mentioned before I was married to an Omega mutant. I know every intimate detail of such a mutant power, said Tichala. No you can't manipulate me with such weak bait. If I am to be your spy it will be on my own terms. Which are?